meditation. The prime purpose of meditation is to quiet the mind. When we hold one thought with interest, as we hold it, all other thoughts keep dropping away, the thoughts of the day, you know, what he, she, he did to me, or what she did, and what I should have done, and my speech wasn't well, and well, my boss gave me a raise, and so-and-so trying to take my job. All these things are going on on subconscious level. But as you hold to one thought, these subconscious thoughts quiet, they get still, they drop into the background, and that quiets the mind. Now, I think one of the most important things in quieting the mind in meditation is interest. When you're very interested in something, in getting an answer to a question, you'll override all other thoughts. So if with intensity we want to know what is God, who am I, what's this world, what's my relationship to it, any of those questions, if there's a real burning desire to get the answer to it, and we hold that question with intensity, then all thoughts will drop away and the mind becomes extremely concentrated. And then the answer shows itself. It comes from within. The answer is there all the time. The quieting of the thought allows us to see it. To see the answer that was there all the time in the realm of knowingness called the self. So I guess the starting point would be the intensity of the desire for the answer. When the, that desire is intense, we get answers. See, that's why man's extremity is God's opportunity. I know when I started thinking is what I thought it was, I had a mind that was as active as any mind could be. But I was at the end of the line, they told me I was finished. I only had days to live and weeks heart attack. And so I had to have the answers. And even though my mind was far more active than the great, great majority of minds, the intensity of the desire for the answers caused me to hold that question obliterating everything else. And uh, I started meditating with no knowledge of metaphysics, no knowledge of meditation. In fact, I was anti all religion and all metaphysics. I thought it was nonsense for the weak-minded, people who believe fairy tales and things like that. But it was only because of the intensity of the desire to get the answer, I had to have the answer, that things began to come, and they came relatively quickly. Over a period of three months, I went from an extreme materialist to the opposite extreme. The material was nothingness, and only the spiritual was the all. But the wish to get the answer was so strong that in spite of that mind being one of the noisiest of minds, the answers began to come. And I automatically fell into things I knew no words for them, like samadhi. Mm -hmm. I would concentrate on something, I'd lose awareness of the world, I'd lose awareness of the body, and it would be just pure thought. The thought itself would be the only thing existing in this universe. That's absorption. When 
the meditator, and the thing meditated upon becomes one. You lose consciousness of everything but that one thought. That's a very concentrated state of mind, and the answer is right there. And another thought would come up. I first started on what is happiness. You know, what what is life? What do I want? Happiness. What is happiness? And I saw happiness dependent upon my capacity to love. First, I thought it was I wanted to be loved. Mm -hmm. and I said, well, that wasn't it. And I thought it was my capacity to love that gave me happiness. What is intelligence? And I hold to it and hold to it and oh, I see it. There's only one intelligence in the universe and we all have direct line to it. And this went on in a matter of three months time. I, I believe I saw the entire picture went all the way. Only because of the concentrated approach. I know nothing about the subject. I know nothing about the direction, the way, the path. But I wanted to know what is this world? Who am I? What's my relationship to it? What makes it tick? Then you see that the whole world is nothing but you. That there never was anything but you, all alone, because there's only one. But that isn't the final state. You come out of it, and there's still a certain amount of mind left. So you go back into meditation until there is no more mind controlling you. When you've eliminated all the habits of thought, all the tendencies of mind, you're free, then you can use mind. And you are the master director of it. It no longer determines you, you determine it. You now we're over 90% controlled by the unconscious mind. See, well, the conscious mind is easily controlled. Subconscious is not because it's a mechanism we set up of not looking at our thoughts making them operate on automatic pilot. We do it to the entire body, it's all automatic now. And then we do it to all thoughts, but the thought we are interested in at the moment. We don't want the thoughts in the first place, so we push them away. We are happiest when there are no thoughts. Sometimes when you work with your hands, you're occupied, you're very happy, right? Why? The thoughts are out of the way. Or well, even subconsciously, it's quieter. We, we really don't want thoughts. Thoughts are the things that make us unhappy. Even the happy thoughts make us unhappy because if we're going to enjoy something then we're concerned about the possibility of maintaining this which we know it's not going to last so the thought of that, of the pleasure at the same time invokes the experience of that it's not going to last So even thoughts of happiness are limited because the 
real happy state is the no thought state, the state of uh, omniscience, beyond thought. Now we start on meditation, but meditation does seem to be a question of many people's minds who have meditated for years and years. And the best type of meditation is with questions. When you just drop into a nice quiet state without questions, you get a good feeling, but no progress of getting the knowledge with a capital K. You're moving toward the quiet state. So if we want to take the shortcut, we start off with the question that we finally have to answer, who am I? I want to keep this with meditation now. Now meditation should be with questions for a more rapid growth. It is where the Gnani's get the advantage over the bhakti. This surrender and devotion throws us into nice feelings, and they're good. But if Nyami goes further, says, all right, don't stop there, get the answer. It's only when we fully know who and what we are that we're at the end of the road. So the fastest and best way to meditate is to hold the question, get quiet until the answer shows itself, and go to the next one until all answers are there. I was very lucky that I knew nothing. Because intellectual knowledge about the subject is an obstacle. The ego substitutes the intellectual knowledge for the real, experiencing of it. I was very, very fortunate not to have had any knowledge of it. However, I prod you in this direction. Don't believe anything. Start from scratch. Build up your knowledge on a solid foundation of proof, step by step. Everyone must do this. And the only useful thing to us is that which we experience. I relate it to driving a car. If I say, I know how to drive a car, you turn the key on, you step on a clutch, you put it in gear and let the gas out and gradually you go forth and so on. I read that in a book. Now I get into a car. Can I drive a car? Not until I experience it can I drive it. The same thing on the path. We must experience everything. We must, of course, adopt the attitude that what these great ones are saying is so. They have experienced it. However, I must check it out and prove it for myself. And the basic truth is that there is only one reality. There is only one absolute truth. And that is that this whole world and universe it's nothing but God, but better than that, it's nothing but my very own self. God is far away. He can be miles and miles into cosmic space. But my very own self is right here. 
is something I know about, is something I can almost make concrete, my very own self. So using self as God, I think it's far more practical than putting him out there, putting him apart from us. But each one must start from the bottom and prove this whole thing out to themselves. And as the proofs begin to come, the more they come, the more we accept what the great ones say. Until we experience the whole thing. Every aid should be a means of quieting the mind. Now, if meditation is difficult, we can prepare the way by chanting. Chanting puts our minds on the chant itself and the thoughts of the day drop away. That quiets the mind. Exercising the body, doing certain asanas and so forth, do the same thing. And anything that helps is good whatever it is. But the basic thing is to quiet the mind. The mind is the only thing that keeps us from seeing our infinity. The mind is nothing but a collection of thoughts of limitation. In meditation we try to quiet that mind so we can see this infinite being that we are. Meditation should never be passive. We should never try to force the mind to go blank. Meditation should always be with question for the best. Meditation. The more we practice meditation, the easier it is to do. To get the real deep insight requires a certain momentum. When meditation gets to be more enjoyable than things of the world, then we go at it with vigor and enthusiasm and desire for it. And then we just can't wait till we get back to it each day. When we get that momentum going, the mind gets quieter and quieter until the sense of itself is just glaring at us. We just laugh. Maybe with all this talk on meditation, we ought to try it. have a lot of centers they concentrate on. The tip of their nose, the navel. Um, the, best, the best place is up here, between the eyebrows. Concentrating here takes your mind off other parts of the body. Besides it being the center for the third eye, the after eye, the spiritual eye. It pulls us away from the lower centers of the body. We can come up here. So if I were to recommend a spot, and it, but 
anything that helps, helps. The heart's a good place because it is a center of feeling, and feeling is closer to the self than thought. It depends on your background. If you're a Vajra Jnani, it would be the heart, but not on the left side, on the right side. If you're a yogi, it would be either the navel or the tip of the nose or up here. And the place you like is the place you had been using in prior lives. Now, when I did my uh, concentrating, it wasn't in any location. Which one wanting to have the answer? That's what I concentrated on. Every thought has to have desire behind it. Otherwise, you wouldn't think. Isn't that so? So there's more than one desire. So the only thing you eliminate is desire itself. Not desire for this thing, desire for that thing. You have billions of desires to eliminate. It takes more than forever. But eliminate desire, and you're finished. Nothing else to do. I'll probably break the triangle down into more. I think I'll start with desire in the top and come down to two. Attachment, divert, and break that down into probably emotions and tendencies and thoughts at the bottom. Growth is so simple, there's nothing complicated about it. It's getting rid of these thoughts that culminate in tendencies, that culminate in emotions, that culminate in desire. Run them out and you're totally free. That's all you have to do. Run out desire itself. Think on that. Desire breaks down to attachments and aversions. If you have desire, who has it? You have. You have it, you cannot have it. Unless you want to hold on to it, then you can have it. Actually, it has you. You have it. Control is a desire. Everyone desires to control every other one. You run out desire and you run out wish to control. Desires, tendencies, thoughts are all the effect of the ego. Knock them out and knock out the ego. Vice Tower looks different to me now than the way it used to. I used to give it to you like Bhagavan. Just discover what you are. I can see now that it's more than that. It's knocking out what you're not that, that is growth. Because your people can get into a high state and stay there. You don't knock out what you're not. So in Vaishara, when you see what you are, you must knock out what you're not. And if you're white, you're not black. If you're cold, you're not hot. So when you see what you are in Vaishara, 
you're not the opposite. And you knock out the opposite. And even in Vaishara, that's the growth, knocking out what you are not. It's possible to see yourself and move away from the mind. You just submerge the mind. That's not growth. I think you've all had sights of the self. Why don't you remain that way? Because you submerge the mind, you put it aside for the time being, you felt great, and after a while the mind re-emerges and you don't feel great. So in Vaishara, you've got to will out what you are not when you see what you are. When you see you're unlimited, you know you're not that limited body. You've got to knock out identification with that limited body. So again, the growth is willing out what you are not, even in Vaishara. But you see, Bhagavan doesn't emphasize that, does he? And I don't think I used to eat in the early days, did I? Because it's so automatic. If you see you're unlimited, how can you see that you're limited? It's the way it seems to you when you're there. From down below, you've got to knock out that which you are not. When you see what you are. when you get up there like Bhagavan is you no more see what you are not seems to be good about it well when you get into the self you see you're not the body so you don't identify as the body anymore but the growth is not seeing yourself the growth is not identifying with the body I know if I move up again, I'll say the same thing. All you got to do is just see what you are. Remember that. Even in my child, growth is willing out that which you are not. When you go high to see what you are, so you can see that you are not the body-mind, and you can will it out. You drop it off so easily when you see what you are. When you see what you are, there's no doubt whatsoever that you're this limited clump of garbage, clay, mud, slam, excrement. There's no doubt about it. So it seems automatic. You see what you are, you will automatically see what you're not. This, is the, this body is the opposite extreme of what you are. You can't be any more limited than a physical body. It's the other extreme end of your infinite beingness. This is one step lower than being a uh, human physical body, and it's not too much lower, not being an animal physical body. The physical body is the bottom end, the opposite end of infinity. And this is what you hold on to for dear life. And again, the way should be so clear to you. The only growth is dropping what you are not, dropping identification with the body mind. Everything else 
the best age to do that. Any questions? And the whole subject summed up as thou art that. Drop all these thoughts to the contrary. What remains over is the infinite you. Isn't that difficult? Isn't that mystical? You keep yourself from realizing it. You read about it instead of realizing it. Reading is not doing you any good. I really believe it's holding you back if you read. You've heard me say that if it's difficult for you to be yourself as it is for you to be a female. That's true. But that's something you ought to work on. Until you see it. That's where effortlessness fits in. It takes as much effort for you to be yourself as it does for you now to be a female. So where's all the effort? I say the faith should be not God, but happiness. Because everyone, I think, is more or less consciously seeking it. And actually, Anyone seeking happiness is seeking their very own self, looking for it externally where it isn't, and feeling their self only momentarily when they stop thinking. The only time you feel yourself is when you stop thinking. The thinking covers over the self. Thinking covers over happiness. But when the desires are fulfilled, the thoughts stop. They're not striving for it anymore, and we're happy. But if this is the attaining of the thing that causes the happiness, it's the stopping of the thinking of how to get it. That stops the thinking and allows the self to be, and that's what happiness is. self being more or less. I guess all in all the very best way is to isolate for periods of the time, go back into the world, out of the world, back into it, in and out. I think it's the very fastest means of growth. And hardly anyone who, of all the people who've been listening to me and hearing me say all these things, who hasn't sunk. Sooner or later, they seem to sort of feel their own strength and then they decide, well, I'm going to use this in the world. And this is where they think. It's impossible to use this in the world. Once you start trying to use it in the world, the world is real. Well, I'll make life better, get more things, get more help. Uh, help the others uh, to know this, things like that. Mm. So straight and narrow is the path, like a razor's edge. This narrow path is a razor's edge, and the moment you step off it, you fall. And they say, oh, I'm emphasizing how important it is to 
Ну, Every day. You don't go for one or two days. However, no effort we make is ever lost. All the effort we make is moving us in the right direction. But the question is, when do you want to make it? This lifetime or several lifetimes from now? If you want to make it this lifetime, it has to be all out. Each step path shows you the way. See, when you drop into Samadhi, you begin to get your realization. Everyone thinks, oh boy, that's Samadhi, that's it. That's the beginning. The ego elimination and quieting the mind go hand in hand. It's the ego that creates all the thoughts. Every thought is to satisfy the ego. So the more you eliminate the ego, the more you, you eliminate thinking. And when you do it enough so that the mind can remain quiet, at least at moments, that moment is Samadhi. And uh, it can be described in words what the feeling is like. They call it absorption. You're thinking on something, uh, what is the world? You keep thinking and thinking, and all other thoughts drop away. When the thoughts drop away, you lose awareness of the world around you. As you keep thinking on it, then you lose awareness of your own body. You forget your body, you forget yourself. And then when you forget the world, you forget yourself, the only thing in mind is that one single thought. And that's the only thing existing in the universe at that moment, that one thought. And since there's only the thought, you're, you are it. Is the way it, it seems that there's only a single thought in this universe. And when you hit that point, the answer is there. Come out of it in a state of ecstasy. It was so high. You're also ego elated because you got a tremendous answer. But it encourages one to do it again and again until all the answers are done. And as you get each answer, you're moving closer to the fullest answer of the question, who am I? What am I? Now, to get to the say that somebody takes, takes that momentum that I talk about. It has to be daily, every day, and we have to want this more than, than we want anything else. We have to want this meditation, this directing of the mind, more than anything else. It gets to be a real delight. You enjoy it more than anything else because you're getting quieter. That's the quietness of mind that gives us happiness and joy. So when you reach a certain point, and it's called it getting over the hump. When meditation is more enjoyable than anything else, then we're over the hump. Then we can get this momentum going. We meditate enough so that we lose consciousness of the world in our body, and then we're in samadhi. We're in the state of absorption, where the, the thinker and the thought become one. And then the answer is there. And that wipes out tremendous amounts of false knowledge of the ego. It wipes out tremendous chunks of ego. And the 
more ego we wipe out, the deeper we can go in the quieting of the mind the next time. When the momentum gets started, never let go and you go all the way. So there's no more ego left. Because if you stop at any time, you'll be sucked back into the world by the amount of ego that's left. Or if you're extremely high into it, you'll get sucked into being a ruler of a world or uh, even a universe. Sometimes he talks about this in his book. You go so high and leave a little ego left, and you get to be ruler of a world or a solar system or something like that. And then it's going to take you, in terms of our time, millions and maybe billions of years to go the last bit away. The place you can go fastest is right here. The higher you go, the slower the rate of growth. Because this is the severest of prodding we get right here in this life that we're in. The most difficult. See, the higher you go, the easier things get. The more everything is okay. The less need there is to grow. And this is the trouble in the astral world. That such a delightful world. There's very few people there who grow. They come back here and do their growing. But things are not so delightful. In fact, to say it's not coming from the things. It's coming from the stilling of the thoughts of desire for the things. The thoughts of Quiet, mind quiet, and the self is right there. The self is always there. It's perfect, it's infinite, here and now. We can't change that. I think we can change other concepts to the contrary. Concepts of ego are the concepts of, to the contrary. So you have to be careful. You can get caught up in that thing. At the beginning, it's all right. Is encouraging you. You master the world. But you gotta be careful that you don't get caught up in trying to remain a master of the world to the degree that your ego is let go of. Love is something you can't turn on, nor can you turn it off. It is what it is. It's according to your state of beingness. the world calls love is other than what we're talking about. Your capacity to love, your level of love, inwardly is the same all the time. But at one moment you let it out more than at another moment. The amount that you have, you can only let out to the, to the degree that you have it. But it always feels high because it's your highest capacity to love. In a high state of love, you love everyone equally, whether they are your own family, your own children, or strangers. The love is exactly equal. That's another way to tell the high state of love. But only to the, to the degree we have it and we express it. And when we're feeling it at our highest point, that's always high to us because that's the highest point we know. But you get into a state of uh, ecstasy where it's overwhelming at times. It gets to be this ever new joy welling up every moment. And you reach a point where you become incapacitated by it. And you rise above that by it dropping into a state of deep, very profound peace. What was a sort of an excitement thing turned out to be a serenity thing. And that's the peace.
peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace that can never be perturbed by anything. Even if you see a bullet coming at you, it wouldn't disturb it one way or So remember, you can use everything that's happening in the world to grow by. It's an excellent chance to undo a lot of ego. Now, the way you fortify yourself is to keep the practices going, the meditating every night, every morning. You never, ever let go. You must withdraw it when you're in the city. Every night and every morning. You gather yourself in. You get the necessary power 